Hello everybody, it's good to see you again and it's good to be able to share with you again. Coming to you with another prayer on gathering and uh, I did send an email out to the folks that are part of uh, this group that normally meets to send me a picture via email if you can do that, if you have to text it to me, however you can get me a picture, I would love to have it so I can uh, enlarge it and make copies and put them on the chairs in the room here so it'll be like I'm actually talking to you. But anyway, you try to see if you can get that done this week so we can share next week. You know, we are meeting together for worship t this Sunday. We got a service at 9 and 11. I'm sure you've been hearing about that. But many of you are in the group that probably will not feel comfortable coming back yet. So uh, you just stay home and enjoy us online worshiping. And also, you know, if you don't have access to one of the Zoom Sunday schools, Lan and I will continue doing our Sunday school class as well. But let's kind of get started uh, with our prayer on gathering, you should have a copy of your prayer list for this week, and hopefully you've looked over that before uh, you watch this, and you know uh, how the list goes, and at the close of our time, you can spend some time praying for them, or whenever you have an opportunity, you can spend time praying for those folks. Now, uh, if you remember last time where we left off before we started our devotion, we made it to Sunday night, and that night, of course, Mickey preached, and Carlos was in doing his translating, and so as we begin today, we'll be on Monday morning, and kind of how we're going to operate from this now on, we may not do a whole day every day, but we'll try to kind of do it day by day and work our way through, so as we begin today, it's a Monday morning, and also each day we'll do a feature on one or two of the maybe more of the groups that are working. And uh, this picture has, of course, I'm in it. You can see very animated talking. But my translator, who has uh, kind of, you see her shoulder there, she's standing up. Her name is Shirley. And uh, Shirley was my translator. And you won't see a lot of pictures of Shirley uh, because she, you know, she's just not in most everybody's pictures. And I didn't take a whole lot of pictures. But that's Shirley. Shirley is 29. She doesn't look nearly that old. And uh, so she, uh, uh, she was my translator, and, and she worked well with me throughout the week. So that's who that is. And now, uh, as we begin, we are going to begin looking this week at the medical and pharmacy. If you remember when we met together, when we first got to the village, we went into their sanctuary, and uh, we were welcomed. Well, that sanctuary has been turned into the medical clinic, and in the back, uh, along the wall you see our pharmacy. So medical and pharmacy were both uh, in this building. The gentleman way in the back is Jim Barrow and he kind of worked with our pharmacy and he's done that for years and does an excellent job even though he is not a pharmacist. We would love to take a pharmacist with us and if you know any that might be interested in going please mention it to them. But we have doctors with us as well and you'll recognize Dr. Capps uh, but the other gentleman there, the short guy, his name is Dr. Alfonso, and he's a Honduran doctor who has been with us many times, and so we're familiar with him. And of course, uh, many of the Hondurans are very short, so it makes uh, Jim look like a giant next to him. But then the guy with this cool story bro shirt on, his name is Christian, and he was a translator for, for them, and uh, he has served as translator for me before. Christian grew up in the children's home, and has uh, gone through the transition time and has aged out and now works as a translator. I'm not sure what else Christian does, but he is good to have with us in the village. All right, then uh, Dr. Hop, uh, Philip Hop went with us. You know, Philip is from Conway. He is a pediatrician and he goes to Second Baptist and uh, he does a great job down there. So we had him with us again this year. This was his third time to go with us. Now, Billy Abbott has gone more than any of us. Billy is a, a nurse, served in the military, and I believe he actually served in, the, in Honduras when he was in the military, uh, part of his time anyway. And uh, he is a registered nurse, and uh, he has gone to Honduras, I think, every year since 1980. So that makes 40 years. He's, he's more experienced than all of us. Uh, and you'll recognize Mary Ann Parsley. Mary Ann, member at Woodland Heights. And she's a nurse that goes with us, and she does a great job. And our other nurse in the middle there is Jeannie Hip. Jeannie is from Crossit, and she is a nurse as well. And we enjoy having her serve with us. And we'll talk more about her because uh, she 
kind of went back over to the village. This is a picture of her in the other village that we worked with some, and we'll talk more about that as we move for, further along in our story. So anyway, we began the day, or, or I began my day, with the devotion. We're there uh, kind of in our eating area in the compound where the ladies would sleep and where our kitchen was. And uh, the, the, you see kind of off in the distance there, those metal boxes, those are the showers. And directly behind me is the little building that has restrooms in it. So that's kind of how we operate. And that's how we began the day together having our devotion. And I've already shared that devotion with you in a previous uh, time uh, when we talked about the, uh, the, the lizard and uh, the one that could walk on water. So you may remember that. So that's how we started our day. And then, oh, I've got another picture of Shirley. So there she is. I didn't know I'd use the same picture twice. I guess I should review this a little bit more, but Shirley does a good job. And uh, you see Hudson there. So this is not actually a, a time that I was sharing the gospel, but it's the best picture I have of Shirley from the week. So Shirley worked with me. And uh, the first day uh, we shared with Eric and I probably have shared with you before, but I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about Eric and his prof profession of faith because Eric uh, has mur had mur murdered four people and uh, was given, I guess he had served some time and was given this property in Coralito to live, and uh, his family lived there with him. If you look close, you'll see he's holding a Bible that he received uh, as I presented the gospel, and we put his name in the back of that after he accepted Christ, and about by his foot is a little Hot Wheels car, and in his hand is uh, two uh, Beanie Babies, so that means he had two daughters and a son that we left those for as well, and in his hand are cards for the dental and medical, or for medical for him, and so, you know, this was kind of an amazing thing. I've never actually had someone who openly admitted to being a murderer. Uh, and uh, so for him to come to Christ was kind of a, an amazing story. Now, another story I want to tell you about that day is uh, we went to visit this gentleman, uh, and he, we were told that he was 102 years old. And I spoke with people in the medical clinics and the eyeglass clinics and the different places that he had been, and they all said that he was 102 and, you know, I really kind of believed him when he told me was that, that he was 102. But then he told me his mother lived to be 140. Yeah, 140. And that he only wanted to live to be 120. So uh, I kind of had my doubts to his exact age, but he's obviously old and he looks to be in good health. And so we were glad that we could share with him. Uh, they said that they were already Christians and so we did not have to share the gospel any further with them. Uh, but that was just kind of one of the interesting sidelines to meet someone who said they were 102 years old. Okay, so then, uh, as I may have mentioned earlier, the village was very small and there weren't a lot of homes to go to. But we had been told, uh, as we visited a home that was kind of up in the top of the village, that if we went up higher, we would get a cell phone signal. Uh, many of you know that we had no cell service the whole time that we were in the village, but we were told if we went way up here, we might be able to get cell signals. So we walked up, and we walked up. I mean, we probably walked, it seemed like five miles, but it was probably more like a mile and a half, up to the very top of the mountain. And it, we had a nice view, but there was still no cell service. What we found out later on is that there was probably cell service there, a cell signal, but there are two different types of service there, and the one that we would have been on uh, was not available up there. It was the other cell phone service that was available. So it was kind of like if you had uh, AT&T and uh, you, you, there was Verizon service available, but it wasn't available for AT&T. So uh, anyway, it was kind of a disappointing walk, but we did see a village over the hill there, and we decided that the next day, Maybe we could go over there. So it wasn't a fruitless walk. We were able to find a place to continue to go to uh, and to share the gospel and to provide ministry. So that was a good thing about it. And then that, that night, I, uh, I preached. And that was my night to preach. And I was glad to have the opportunity to do that. I looked and looked and looked to try to find a picture 
of that service. And this is the only picture I could find. I think someone was taking a picture of the dog sleeping there in the back. Uh, and this was not during the preaching time, so I can't be the one that put him to sleep at that point. It looks like we're still standing up singing and having our worship time together. But I enjoyed getting to share. It was a message I had shared with this uh, prayer gathering group when we talked about the prodigal son. And so I shared that with them that night. Okay, now we're going to kind of, because we made it through the end of the day, we're going to move into our devotion time. And I've been basing my devotions basically on animals that are there native to Honduras. And, uh, you know, they're not all wild animals. I talked about sheep last week. And we'll see in a minute that I'm going to be talking about cows this week. So I have a few uh, jokes that kind of go along with that. The first one, a devout... A devout excuse me, a devout, a Christian cowboy had lost his favorite Bible while he was mending fences out on the range. Three weeks later, a cow walked up carrying the Bible in its mouth. The cowboy couldn't believe his eyes. He looked at the book and it, it, he raised his eyes and he, he said, it's a miracle. And the cow said, not really. Your name's written in the front. <laughs> well, you know, it's amazing to me how many people that leave their Bibles at our church don't have their name written in the front. So even a cow couldn't find them. All right, we have a few more jokes. Hopefully you can laugh at some of these. Uh, what do cows have? No, why do cows have no money? Because the farmers milk them dry. What did the mother cow say to the baby cow? It's pasture bedtime. What do you call a cow with no legs? Ground beef. What do you call a cow with a twitch? Beef jerky. And, uh, what kind of milk do you get from a forgetful cow? Milk of amnesia. Uh, what did the Secret Service, why did the Secret Service surround the president with dozens of cows? They were trying to beef up security. And what does a cow like best about math? Calculus. Why doesn't Sweden export its cattle? It wants to keep its stock home. And finally, why do cows wear bells? Of course, because their horns don't work. Okay, uh, enough for the humor. I hope maybe you laughed at a couple of those. Maybe not. But anyway, uh, there was a cow who was right across from where our uh, sleeping quarters were. And he wasn't there all the time. But just like the sheep that we talked about last week, part of the time he was there. Or she, because you see they're milking the cow. Uh but anyway, there are 3 million cows in Honduras and only 8 million people. That's like one cow to every two and a half people. Now we're going to look at some cow facts. You know, cows are herbivores and they eat a whole lot of stuff. You ought to really look it up. It's amazing. They can eat as much as 40 uh, pounds of food a day and drink as much as 50 gallons of water. That's just kind of crazy. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's what a cow does. And, you know, they have a stomach that has four different chambers. I tried to figure it out, but I couldn't. Just, just believe me, they have four chambers in their stomach, which is why they're always chewing. You know, they, we say they chew their cud. That's part of their digestive process. Okay, there are well over one billion cattle in the world. And over 300,000 of, excuse me, 300 million of those live in India. And they continue to live in India because cows are sacred in India, and they do not kill cows. I've heard stories from Steve. You know, he and the Lassiter served in India, and the cows are treated better than the people are. Okay, now, you know that young cattle are called calves. The female are called cows. The males are called bulls. Okay, and cattle, it says, are red-green colorblind. And now, I'm red-green colorblind, I believe, uh, so I guess I see colors like cows do, but uh, they say the 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 you know the bull in the bullfight doesn't charge because the the uh, cape is red. He char charges because it's moving around and they're waving it, and that makes him angry, or he's been trained to charge at something like that. But you know I had read uh, all kinds of stuff over the years. You know I think I'm pretty intelligent. But the one thing that I found out in doing this is I did not know that oxen were just cows. They're bovines. I thought an ox was a completely different animal. 
I know there's a musk ox that is a different animal, but usually when we hear about an ox, they're talking about a cow, and you probably know this and think I'm crazy for not knowing it already, but this is the first time I learned that, and I told Lana about it, and she had never heard that either. So anyway, that was amazing to me because, you know, the Bible talks a lot more about ox and oxen than it does about cows, and I was wondering why that was, and that's really why that, that is. You know, the, only, the, the main verse we see in Scripture about uh, cattle is uh, in Psalm 50. 10, it says, for every animal of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. And you see the verse I've got there. And uh, we had, a, uh, all, by the way, all these pictures I showed you that had cows in them were cows that were, were there in Coralito or around Coralito. This was when we visited the, uh, the river that was not too far away from Coralito. But we, they, had a, they had a young calf that would chase the people down and was, was uh, mooing at them. So... Uh, there are a lot of cows there. I have a couple of stories uh, for our devotion, and I'm just going to kind of read them to you. I thought they were both pretty amazing. And, uh, you know, God, uh, God is God over everything. You know, he's not just God over us. He's God over wildlife and uh, tame life and everything. He can do whatever he wants to do. The first story happened at Dallas Theological Seminary when they were needing $10,000. This was back in the early days of the seminary, and during a prayer meeting, one of the Bible teachers, Harry Ironside, which we've, who we've all heard of, was praying, and he said, Lord, you own the cattle on a thousand hills. Please sell some of those cattle to help us meet this need. Shortly after the meeting, they received a check for $10,000, and it had been, already been sent days before he prayed, and he had no idea that they had that urgent need, but he did enclose a note that said he, he had sold some cattle and gotten $10,000 in them. Isn't that kind of amazing that God used it in that way? And then the other one, this is kind of a lengthy story. This was actually in Guidepost magazine, but I want to share it with you. I grew up on a small dairy farm. This is a, a, young, a girl who, who relates this story. In a small dairy farm in northern Michigan. We had about 50 head of cattle at any given time, and it was my chore in the morning to help my father milk them before he left for his work as a high school teacher. My brothers and sisters joined in milking again after we came home from school. In my 16th year, something happened on the farm that not only convinced me that God was looking out for me, but also that God has a sense of humor. I love the farm and I love the ritual of milking. I was the oldest of five children, but this early morning chore was something I did alone with my father, whom I always adored. Each morning, the cows would wait patiently outside the barn for the milking. Dad and I would usher them inside six at a time, milk them, and then usher them back out on the other side of the barn through a different door. As we hooked them up to the milking equipment, I would think about my day and my life. It was usually dark and often cold, sometimes extremely cold, cold as it can be in Michigan, but the cow's steaming breath and their passive trust always warmed me up. It was a fine way to start the day. Cows must be milked twice a day, no matter what. If they aren't milked, they can get mastitis, a not uncommon infection for which they need antibiotics. This renders a cow's milk unusable until she heals up. Even when a cow is sick, however, she has to be milked, and that milk cannot be consumed or sold. It must be poured out. One time, I had neglected to separate the mastitis milk from the rest of the herd's daily take. That evening, my father made me pour out the entire day's milking down the drain in the barn floor by myself. None of that day's milk for, from any of our cows could be sold. I cried the entire time I poured. Dad wasn't unkind. He simply wanted me to never again to forget how important this detail was, and I never did forget. One day when I was 16, my family was away for the day. I don't remember why I was alone, but night milking needed to be done, and I have to do it by, and I'd have to do it by myself. Five cows had mastitis and were on antibiotics. Each cow had a number attached to her ear, and Dad had given me a list of the five infected cows' numbers. I would need to pour out the milk from those cows. The best way to do all this was to separate the infected cows from the rest of the herd and then milk everybody. At low light, I headed for the barn. There was a small corral where the 50 cows all crowded together, all waiting for me to milk them. Now, cows aren't like horses. They're big and passive and not exactly high energy, so they aren't the easiest creatures to lead. 
getting five Pacific cows out of the herd was going to be difficult. First, I'd have to weave in between them and read their numbers to find the five cows. Then I'd need to throw a lead rope or prod them somehow to get each one of them out there and herd it into another pen without the other cows getting out too. And as I say, cows aren't horses. They don't automatically move aside. They're very curious and consequently they may actually get in the way and become obstacles. Or they may just decide to follow an infected cow out of the corral. Then I'd have to get the infected cow into the other pen and the healthy cow back into the corral, keeping the rest of the herd from spilling out by myself. So although separating the five alien cows from the rest wouldn't be an impossible task, it wasn't going to be an easy one. Memories of pouring milk down the drain still smarted. I didn't want to mess this up. I opened the gate and entered the corral. The cows, as cows are wont to do, turned as a group and stared at me. I suddenly wished my siblings were there to help. It occurred to me that God cares about all the details of our lives. Perhaps this was a time to enlist God's help. So while I held the list of numbers in my hand, I raised my other hand in the air. It seemed appropriate to do. Then with all the faith of a child, I spoke in a loud voice toward the heavens, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, would the following cows please step forward. Numbers 2, 11, 17, 32, and 49. I don't know why I said that or even why I said it that way. I felt pretty silly and was glad no one else was around. But as soon as I finished speaking, I heard a rustling noise from the back of the corral. You know what happened, of course. Cows numbered 2, 11, 17, 32, and 49 wriggled their way through the herd and came forward. And other cows actually stepped aside for them. I was reminded of the parting of the Red Sea. I picked up my jaw from the ground, opened the gate, herded each of the five in the other pen, and then locked the rest of the amazingly cooperative herd back up to prepare to milk. Separating the sick cows probably took me all of two minutes, and milking that early evening took no more time than usual. I didn't tell my folks about it that night. In fact, I usually never tell this story. Who would believe it? It's the only time something like that has ever happened in my life, but I never forgot it. And I've always appreciated it. As I said, I think God has a sense of humor. We're made after his image, after all. It's true that on that day, God smiled on me and made the work of this young laborer a little easier. But when he used a herd of dairy cows as his agents, I like to imagine that he winked, too. That's a pretty amazing story, isn't it? How God used those cows to teach her a lesson. And God can use anything to teach us a lesson. I hope you enjoyed that today. And uh, I hope you remember now to spend some time in prayer. Let's pray before we close our time together. Dear Lord, we thank you for uh, what I've been able to share about the trip to Honduras and for Eric and his, his profession of faith. Father, I pray for him that you help him to continue to grow in Christ. I pray for the others that we make contact with or there, Lord. Continue to bless them. And Lord, we thank you that you teach us lessons from animals, Father, how the cows in this story can show us that you're in control of everything. We thank you for being a God who we can depend on and who meets our needs. Father, we know there are a lot of people right now who have needs because of what's going on in our nation and in our world. Continue to meet our needs. Father, And may we be aware of your presence. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you.